Hi, um, uh, I've really been a fan of electoral integrity and what you're doing and, and the good work coming out of here. And so it's an honor to be here and be able to present a little bit of what uh, we're doing. I'm actually working on several projects that sort of are in the realm of what, what you guys are interested in and, and, uh, and excited to hear thoughts and feedback on, on this particular project. Um, this is a project I should, I, I just need to make clear, is a, is a, co is a project with uh, three other uh, um, uh, three other scholars, SE leader uh, Nico Ravanilla and Dean uh, Yang, all at University of Michigan. Um, uh, Steve is a, uh, is a um, sort of business economist, uh, and Dean is an economist, which will help explain to those of you in the paper some of uh, some of what's there and and uh, um, some of the flavor of some of what's there. Um, the but the motivation for this uh, for this uh, paper and this project is this this phenomenon of vote buying, vote selling, which we know is is um, common in lots of I mean, developing democracies here, but actually common in lots of democracies, particularly among, uh, among poor voters. Um, in the Philippines, there's no exception. Estimates, um, uh, recent estimates were that, in a recent election, were that upwards of 30%, maybe higher in some places, of, of voters um, had uh, accepted money uh, in exchange for their votes. Uh, we're defining vote buying here uh, as, um, in sort of very prosaic way, the, the offer of resources by political campaigns or individuals. Um, to individuals or households in order to persuade them to vote for a particular candidate. So um, nothing, nothing too earth-shattering there. And most vote buying in the Philippines, this, this happens, it works slightly differently in lots of, in, depending on which country you're looking at, but in the Philippines, um, the cultivation of relationships with voters, with voters and candidates is a year-round, you know, is a year-round process, but the actual um, act of vote buying occurs Pretty much in the week up, the week leap before the election, right? You want to be sure the voters are, you know, are have you first in their mind when they go to the voting booth. Uh, and so candidates develop campaigns, develop lists of can voter lists of candidates, and they have their representatives, their vote brokers, pretty much go door to door um, and offer individuals and households uh, money or goods in exchange for the vote. So sometimes it's good. So um, this is a, a noodle packet here in the bottom uh, with the camp with the candidates uh, little poster on top. Um, uh, there's actually a hierarchy of noodles. There's good noodles and bad noodles. As you know, we have the good noodles. This right here, a little hard to see, but this is a candidate's house. Uh, and the second house here underneath it is it's an open sort of area. And this is all packed up with uh, pallets of noodles, with pallets of noodles, kind of those trees you can see there. And while we were there during this day, um, uh, you know, the candidate and talking with him, uh, we, there was just a parade of vote brokers coming by to collect their, their allotments and then take back. And that night they were doing uh, called midnight deliveries, going out to deliver those. Um, uh, deliver those to the, the various uh, the, the, the various people on their list. Now, in addition to this, almost all candidates all offer money. Um, and based on uh, the observations of our project field staff in the last election, vote buying payments differed substantially uh, across uh, across races. So, in the mayor and the vice mayor races, um, for example, the amounts were somewhere between 250 and 500 pesos. So that's about six to twelve dollars uh, U.S. Uh, for mayor, and, uh, sorry, for um, uh, for city council, somewhere between 20 to 100 pesos, which is uh, up, upwards of three, uh, two to three dollars U.S. Um, the vote buying is, is really systematic and and, and fairly strategic. Um, typically, um, uh, you'll uh, they'll you'll, you'll approach a household, and there'll be a, there'll be a, um, a obscure the names. This is technically illegal, even though it's. No, never enforced. Um, uh, but uh, so that you'll, you'll, you'll approach a household, the broker approach a household, there'll be an envelope for, uh, for each candidate, or for each, each person in the household, their name, each one in the household, their name will be written on it, the candidate's name will be written on it, it'll be numbered so they, they can track who takes it and who doesn't take it. Um, uh, and then once you open it up, uh, there's this nice message from the candidate telling us uh, why this person's the best person to vote for, and then a little inducement at the top uh, to, uh, to, you know, to, to, for your trouble. Uh, campaigns go to a lot of trouble to make sure that, that voters clearly associate their gift with the candidate. And then, you know, this is this would be obviously something you want to avoid is having someone, you know, not remember who gave them the money. Um, and so uh, the candidate's flyer may be stapled to those to, to packages of food or bags of rice, and like, like that earlier example. Um, it might be uh, attached to these flyers. But the most common way to do this is to actually staple the money to a sample ballot. Um, with the candidate's name sort of in bold, so there's no mistake who it is. But then also other candidates across the, across the ticket, up and down, will be on there as well. This will often cross party lines, so there's all kinds of negotiation, money to change his hands, who's on what ballots, right? And if you want, you want to be sure you're on a ballot with popular politicians up and down the ticket. So, um, and then you invite voters to take that ballot with, you to, with them to the polling booth and use that as their sort of guide when they cast their votes. 
Um, the, uh, um, now, with some of my favorite moments of last election were actually sitting down with candidates and usually I've I'm been in having them give me sort of short courses on vote buying, right? Here's, here, here's best practices, right? Here's how you do it. And so I had last, last election, we had one candidate in city council, for example, go to great lengths to explain to me why the bottom right ballot is clearly superior to the bottom left ballot. Um, the, uh, both candidates are actually offering the same amount of money, about uh, 300 pesos. But the candidate on the bottom left made the rookie mistake of not fanning the bills. So you could see immediately how much was, how much was there. And then he compounded that by uh, stapling the money on the back of the ballot rather than the front of the ballot. So, um, uh, you know, bad, and he actually lost, but uh, that wasn't the only reason. Um, so part of our, part of our motivation um, is, is, is understanding why this actually works, right? Why does vote buying actually uh, why is this actually effective, or is it effective, and um, why is it perceived to work? I um, mean, that, that part of this, you know, part of this, it, it's not obvious that it should work, right? Enforcement's actually really difficult. Um, uh, in some cases, impossible, particularly where in the Philippines, where they've mo recently moved to electronic or automated voting technologies. When you used to have a paper ballot, it was a little easier. There were systems where you could sort of have voters drop a blank ballot in and then bring back the, 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 the pre marked ballot, sort of have a system, a chain system going. But now it's really hard to know actually how voters uh, um, uh, voted. And even if you can tell uh, that a voter defected, if you get that information, it's actually really costly to punish them. Uh, now this is going to vary by country and vary by situation, but uh, in part of a large, uh, a larger another project we're doing on money politics in Southeast Asia, we did intensive field work in the last Indonesian elections, and one of the things we asked candidates and vote brokers was, "What do you do when you find when you find out a, 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 somebody you gave money to didn't vote for you?" Uh, and uh, almost universally, the reply is, "Well, we really can't do anything, right? If we punish them, uh, that's going to get out, and that's actually going to cause us more harm than than good." Now, it's, it's quite possible the voters actually believe differently, right? And even if this is what candidates believe, voters actually think something different. And we have survey work actually we're trying to, to do to try and tap into some of those voter attitudes. Do they think their vote is really secret? Uh, what, do, uh, what do they think will happen if they do defect? Um, but even if there isn't a threat of, of, of punishment, there are other reasons why we might expect vote buying and vote selling. So there, it's possible that this is, in many, in many cases, just an entry fee, right? This is this is the this is the price you pay to be a serious contender. You, it's not about persuasion. It's not about winning supporters. It's just to demonstrate that you're a uh, winning candidate. Um, uh, but uh, another common hypothesis, and this is one that, that everybody here will have heard, is that this is um, that uh, that this that vote buying, vote selling are, are supported by um, norms of reciprocity. Right? So you don't need explicit or implicit promises of punishment. You just have this expectation, this culture of gift giving, uh, in particular societies that support this, uh, uh, this kind of exchange. And so when you have these kind of gift giving cultures, the argument goes, um, A, it's difficult for candidates not to offer a gift. It's expected. Right? Uh, B, it makes it difficult for voters to refuse a gift when it's offered. And then C, uh, it makes it hard for voters to actually then refuse a request from the gift giver uh, once the gift has been received. Um, and there's, there's, there's various studies that have, been, that have been done around the world to sort of support some of these ideas. So, for example, um, in Paraguay, um, uh, we, we, the, there's evidence that, that the brokers tend to target more reciprocal individuals, people they know will feed, have these attitudes of, uh, of reciprocity. Um, you also see candidates often working through networks where these norms are likely to be the strongest. So organizational networks, uh, existing patron client networks, uh, family or, or kinship networks are very, are very important in the Philippines. Um, and uh, you know, and, and so with this is background. There is tons of uh, um, uh, efforts to try and end this practice. Right? Uh, this is so we're motivated by this this sort of constant um, attempt in the Philippines to try and beat this this practice back. Um, so extensive uh, education persuasion efforts, some by government agencies, some by the National Election Commission, some by uh, private agencies, NGOs, church groups. Um, uh, and with, with, with messages every election, um, uh, your vote is valuable, it doesn't have a price, um, uh, uh, take the bait but not the hook is a very famous campaign by the uh, Archbishop of the Philippines uh, telling voters to take the money and run, right, that it wasn't a moral sin to, to do this. Uh, in Thailand, we have a very similar thing where the, where the, the leading Buddhist uh, um, uh, clergy told people that it was not immoral, it was not amoral to take money from candidates and to then vote for whoever you wanted, and they were encouraged to do so. Um, and these, these have a long history, right? This is actually from 1953, a poster from 1953, where voters were encouraged not to sell their votes and not betray the, 
um, the heroes of the uh, of, of, of Philippine independence. Um, these are from most, the most recent election, uh, or sorry, more recent elections. Um, the sort of top corner one is from 2001. It says, your vote is valuable. It doesn't have a price. Your character is priceless. So this election, don't sell your character. Don't sell your vote. Um, and then we have the one, the one on the sort of the bottom left. Um, don't be blinded by money. Vote with your conscience. So being blinded by money is a really popular um, uh, sort of imagery in the Philippines. And that, this, this one comes from 2011. Uh, don't be blinded by money. Uh, my vote, my dignity. So lots of these campaigns to try and um, uh, reduce uh, vote buying and vote selling. But the fact that after 60 years, this is still a necessity, right, uh, suggests at least a couple of things. So one, those campaigns have been very successful. Uh, and two, we still don't have a really good understanding, good handle of what motivates voters to sell their votes in the first place and how to effectively uh, intervene to induce changes in behavior. And it's interesting, if you interview candidates, they universally abhor this practice. At least say they abhor this practice. It's inconvenient. They hate doing it. It's expensive. Um, voters say they prefer politicians who uh, who who, uh, who are clean, uh, and yet this practice uh, practice continues. So in this paper, we uh, report on a field experiment testing um, an anti-vote selling intervention in the Philippines. Uh, we individual voters were randomly assigned to treatments, uh, and we asked them to promise not to sell votes in a variety of different ways, trying to echo. Uh, sort of popular strategies that, 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 that anti-vote buying, anti-vote selling groups have used. Um, uh, as a proxy for vote selling, we're going to use something called vote switching, and I'll talk about uh, more about what that is. So basically, did you vote for someone uh, other than the, the candidate you ranked as your most preferred uh, uh, candidate? And we're going to look at differences across kinds of promises and across kinds of electoral races as a way to try and get estimates that are robust to social desirability bias. Uh, and then we also, in the paper, I won't talk much about today, but we, we develop a, a simple behavioral model that tries to make sense of some of the results that we have, uh, some of which were actually kind of surprising, at least to us. Um, OK, so uh, for the mechanics here, the, the experiment we did was conducted in Source of Golden City, uh, which is uh, down here at Source of Golden Province, um, uh, is located at the very southern tip of Luzon Island. Uh, it's roughly about 12 hours uh, by road from the capital. Uh, Manila. Uh, Sorsogon City is the capital of, uh, of Sorsogon, and it uh, has a population of 150,000. It's, it's, um, it's and it's about the median in terms of from municipalities in the Philippines in terms of economic development, in terms of poverty. So, in terms of external validity, uh, external validity, this is a fairly typical municipality in a fairly typical province. Um, the uh, the study consisted of two surveys: a pre-election baseline survey that we conducted between five and 26 days before the election, then a post-election survey about the same period after the election. I'll talk more about these uh, each in, in some more detail here. Um, we selected uh, participants from the certified list of voters that produ produced by the Commission on Election, and that, that, that includes uh, the, the voter's name, their address, uh, their date of birth, their gender, and the signed polling station in Source of Golden City. And total in Source of Golden City, there was about 800, or sorry, about 84,000 uh, registered voters. And so from this list, we then randomly selected 900 primary targeted uh, respondents and then 900 alternates. And the surveys were administered door to door uh, um, uh, using uh, iPads uh, as, the, uh, as the instrument. Um, the, uh, so as, uh, as part of the survey, the baseline survey, we asked uh, voters questions about themselves, and then also questions about municipal elections in Source of Golden City. So we're asking questions about mayor, vice mayor, and city council. Uh, mayors and vice mayors in the Philippines are elected first past the post, uh, but they don't, run, they, run on, they, they don't run on a joint ticket. So voters elect separately the, the mayor and the vice mayor, and it is very often the case that you have a mayor from one party and the vice mayor from another party. Um, uh, city council members are, are elected using a block vote, so there are four seats. Voters cast up to four votes for whichever four candidates they like, and then the top four vote getters win those, uh, win those seats. Both the way that the, the mayor and vice mayor are elected the split ticket and the block vote tend to be systems that undermine the importance of party label uh, for both candidates and, uh, and, and, uh, and voters, and tends to encourage individual candidates to develop personal networks of, uh, of support. I can talk more about that if people are interested. So for each candidate running in those municipal races, we ask voters to rate those candidates on a Likert scale, um, from extremely unfavorable to extremely favorable. So seven point scale. Uh, and they just put their finger on the iPad and they sort of moved the, the dot to where they, you know, where they prefer, you know, where they, where they rated that candidate. Um, the, uh, um, and it seems like that voters are mostly being truthful, right? Um, uh, the, uh, 
you don't have to look too much at the, the details of the table here, but what we've got those first three columns, we have actually what the voter, what the candidates got in terms of their vote share, um, what the voters said, what, 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 what we get from the voter reports after the, after the election, uh, and uh, what the average, average favorability rating of those candidates. Now you can see that, um, as is the univer universally the case, um, uh, voters over uh, over report uh, support for the winners. So the actual support for B here was 48 percent, 55 percent of the voters recall voting for uh, Canada report voting for candidate B. Um, but the correlation between those uh, the reports and the actual vote share is actually really high. Um, it's uh, um, uh, almost 96 percent, and there's a strong correlation also between how favorably they viewed a candidate and their reports, the reports of voting for them, and the support uh, of uh, the actual support that that uh, the actual vote share that candidates uh, received. So, and then also this other table is just to give you a sense that, uh, that, that there's actually considerable variation in terms of individual candidate ratings by uh, by voters. Um, uh, so we, we have some nice variation we can actually leverage in this. Uh, in this service. So it's not everybody's, they don't like everybody, right? There is people they hate, people they like. Um, okay, so all respondents were, after the, the, this sort of background information uh, and the, the candidate ratings were then shown the same anti-voting public service ad. So this was one that was nationally produced. Um, it's, it's, this is a very famous comedian in the Philippines, also a social activist, and they were shown this, this, this video. Um, and it was important that we show this to everybody because we were worried that um, the, treat, the, the treatment itself, asking people to pledge not to, to buy votes, would actually um, uh, include that would, would, would imply an implicit suggestion that this was a that this was a bad thing. So we wanted everybody to sort of have this 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 frame to begin with, um, uh, sort of aimed at equalizing the pitch against vote selling across all treatment groups. So everybody control treatment have this sort of don't sell your vote uh, um, uh, message. And then um, we asked, um, uh, we, we, we then, after the initial questions of the video, randomly assigned respondents into a control group and one of two treatment groups. Um, and this all comes to the very end of the survey, um, at the end of the baseline service, the last thing they do. Um, so the first intervention, um, uh, the first uh, group, uh, we asked them, uh, would you promise not to take the money from any candidate or local leader before the election? Um, and the second intervention, the other, the other, the other group gets, uh, if any candidate or local leader gives you money before the election and you decide to keep it, would you promise to vote according to your conscience? So take the money and run. So we've got don't, don't take any money or take the money and run. And then they could click on one of two symbols, either the handshake saying, um, yes, I promise, or the, uh, the, the, this hand, no, I can't make that promise. Um, and these are designed, they were designed, we crafted these as, uh, to, to be as close as we could make them to sort of actual anti-vote buying campaigns that people are familiar with. Um, uh, the, uh, and both of the, and, and it's very common to have people sort of make a pledge, sometimes publicly, sometimes in private, to not take money or to take the money and, and vote your conscience. Um, in addition, once if they agreed to make the promise, then we also had them uh, write I promise with their finger on the iPad. And overall we had, um, uh, 51%, 51.4% uh, uptake on promise one, and 55.7% uptake on promise uh, two. So the majority of people made the promise. Um, slightly more than half were either willing to make the promise not to sell their votes or to take the money and vote their, uh, vote their conscience. Now the big challenge obviously is that we gotta figure out whether or not these promises have any effect. Um, to do that we need some measure of vote selling. And that's a hard thing to do. Uh, the Philippines has a secret ballot, um, and so measurement of vote selling behavior is, is really a challenge. Um, we could ask people directly if they took money for the votes, and that's been done in surveys, uh, but of course this raises all kinds of concerns about voters um, uh, lying because of social desirability bias or because they want to please the experiment, the, 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 the enumerator. Um, although, interestingly, just as a side note, um, some of the um, survey experiments we've done actually suggest that social desirability bias might not be a huge problem in the Philippines. Often when you do list experiments, you find that reported vote buying is pretty low, but in list experiments it's pretty high. In the Philippines, the gap's actually not that high. Um, it's not something most people are ashamed of, right? Sure, I, you know, I took money for my vote. That's just how it works. Um, but we didn't ask participants directly about whether they sold their votes because we didn't want that kind of, uh, that worry about that kind of bias. Um, and the extent that bias exists, then that would, um, that could lead to spurious findings uh, um, in terms of the effects of our treatments on, on vote selling. Um, so our approach instead uh, um, is to simply ask participants at the end line survey who they voted for in those races. 
Uh, and then to compare their reported votes in the N-Line survey with how they rated those candidates before uh, the election. Uh, so the key, our key variable then, our key dependent variable is vote switching. So it's one if, for the mayor and, or, or vice mayor, if they uh, voted for a candidate other than the candidate they ranked first in, their, uh, in, in the pre-election survey. Um, for city council, it's if uh, there's at least one candidate in those top four that they voted for. They're, they're, they're the four if, if one candidate before they voted for was not in their top four in the pre um, in the pre election survey. Um, so overall, we observed that 56 percent of voters switched in at least one race. Um, uh, 12 percent switched in the mayor race. 22 percent switched in the vice mayor race. 44 percent switched in the city council uh, city council race. Now, the validity of this measure rests on a couple assumptions, right? So first of all. Um, uh, Let's see. So first of all, uh, we assume that their initial rankings of, of, of candidates actually reflects their underlying preferences, right? This, they're not being strategic in this. They're not anticipating what we're going to ask. They're not anticipating. They're not thinking down the game and thinking, okay, I want to be sure that when I when they give me the next survey in in, in three weeks, that my my answer now is going to match that answer, right? That that's you know that we don't think that's what's going on there. They don't know there's going to be another survey. First of all, and second of all. Uh, this comes before any discussion about vote buying or anything else. So this is just, how do you like these candidates? Um, so we think it's reasonable that this, that this represents their, their sort of true preferences. Um, but there's also, you know, there might be a lot of reasons why candidates switch, or voters switch their, their support from one candidate to another, right? Some of those might be vote buying, but it might just be, hey, I met the candidate and he seemed like a nice guy, or um, there's new information, a scandal erupts, or um, I get information about policies, about, you know, so all kinds of reasons why you might legitimately switch. So our second assumption is that through the beauty of random assignment, those kinds of legitimate switchers should be equally represented both in our control and our treatment groups, right? That we're going to have those, those, kinds of, those kinds of switching reasons are going to be present in both our control and in our, in our, in our interventions. Um, and so the vote switching across treatment groups should represent differences in, uh, in vote selling. Okay, uh, so um, I'm not going to take a lot. I'm not going to spend time talking about what we do for social desirability problems, uh, bias. That is that is a concern. We have a variety of strategies to try to deal with this. That we outlined the paper, and I'm happy to talk about that more in the, in the discussion if uh, if we want. Um, but let me look at uh, um, sort of this 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 vote switching measure before we look at the main results. Just talk about how. You know, does it does it produce the kind of outcomes that we'd expect uh, in areas that, that we're not actually interested in theoretically? Um, so areas outside the theory. So if the if the vote switching measure um, accurately reflects voting patterns, we'd expect that vote switching would be related to voters' candidate ratings, right? So. Um, it might not take me take much. I might be more likely to switch if I'm really indifferent between one and two, and it's just, you know one's just barely rated ahead of a candidate number two. We expect it to be less like voters be less likely to switch if there's a huge gap between one and two, right? If if I really like one and number two is the devil, right? That's that that's so so we uh, for each race we calculate that favorability gap, the difference between your rating of your most preferred candidate and then the next person on the list. Um, and, uh, and we look and see whether that predicts, how well that predicts uh, your vote switching. And as we expected, there's a negative relationship. So the bigger the gap, the less likely you are to switch. Um, that, that holds for if we look at all the races together and if we look at each race individually. Um, we can also look at how switching is related to um, how much money voters are off or how prevalent the money is in the campaign. We asked uh, our enumerators to rate the vote buying activities of candidates, all the candidates in the race, on a five point scale. One is no money at all, five is a lot of money, they, they use vote buying a lot. And as expected, mayoral candidates almost all used money. Um, uh, so their, their rating was, uh, this is a five point scale, their rating was uh, 4.97, um, vice mayors 3.49, city council 2.75. And for each voter, then, we can compare the average rating for candidates that dropped out of their, their top ranking, so even the city council, the, they dropped out of the top four from the city council, and those who were added to those um, uh, top rankings. And, um, uh, and as we expect, the added candidates have significantly higher uh, uh, vote buying ratings than the candidates that are dropped. So it looks like um, candidates, uh, the voters are disproportionately switching towards candidates who are doing more of the vote buying. So that's reassuring, at least in terms of measure, not in terms of uh, you know, efficiency and effectiveness of elections. But, uh, and then uh, finally, um, we, uh, uh, for each voter, we also calculate a vote buying gap. So that is the gap between your most, how, how much, 
uh, your, your most preferred candidate is relying on vote buying um, uh, and um, the rating for your second most preferred candidate. Um, and the bigger the difference, um, the more disadvantaged your preferred candidate is to uh, competing candidates. Um, and, um, and then we look to see, again, the extent to which that predicted um, uh, vote switching behavior. And, and what we see is um, the bigger the gap between what my candidate is offering and what the next, my next most preferred candidate is offering, the more likely I am to switch. So um, even though I like you a lot, if the other guy is offering 10 times what you're offering, I'm um, sorry. You know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm looking for greener pastures. So much for loyalty. That's right. Um, the, uh, um, now, the, uh, we've got the, the full regression tables in the paper, but let me, let me sort of walk through just a few figures to, to sort of wrap things up here. Um, uh, just to sort of summarize the figures. So we're going to show in these figures um, the fraction of vote switching. So that's what's on the, uh, the y-axis. Uh, we're going to show it by treatment condition. Uh, and we've got 95% confidence intervals up, up the top there. So first, we're going to look at all the races together. Uh, and in the control group, 57% uh, of the subjects or so switched their votes uh, at least once in at least one of the races, compared to 50% in the promise in the um, don't take any money treatment, um, and 61.8% uh, and in promise treatment too. Um, so it looks like the promise treatments actually have opposite effects. Uh, we, uh, when we ask subjects not to take any money, um, that reduces vote switching. Um, we ask subjects to vote their conscience, even if they take the money, uh, um, even if they take the money, uh, then that actually marginally increases vote switching. So let's, uh, if we break that down by race, um, we see um, sort of similar patterns. Let's see, where are we here? Um, yeah, there we are. Um, so we break down by race, uh, for city council races, uh, the control, uh, the control group, and promise two. There's no difference, right? So the having pe telling people to or having people pledge to take the money and not and vote their conscience doesn't reduce vote selling at all. In fact, there's a not significant, but a small increase in terms of their probability of switching. Um, but there is a significant decrease in the um, uh, in vote switching for those who who pledged to promise one, who promised not to take any money. Um, if we look at the mayoral races, a very different story. Um, uh, here, the promise one has no effect at all, um, but promise two actually increases uh, the, uh, your propensity to switch um, uh, by, uh, by a substantial, uh, substantial amount. Um, so uh, to just to sort of sum up here um, uh, those findings, uh, the treatment inviting, the inviting voters to promise not to take money from candidates do, does, does reduce vote switching by about uh, 8 to 10 percentage points, depending on the model. Um, uh, uh, and promise two uh, uh, is substantively and statistically significantly less effective. Uh, and if anything, it increases uh, vote switching uh, among voters. Um, it also is the case that this treatment varies by, uh, um, varies by race. Um, in lower money races, the city council, the first promise treatment actually reduces vote selling, um, uh, but it's, while negative, no longer significant in, mayor in the mayoral races, um, in the vice mayoral races. Uh, and, in the, and there's no negative effect at all that we can find for Promise 2 in any of the models. Uh, there's essentially no effect in the city council races. In the larger, more moneyed races, um, there's a positive effect uh, in, those, in those races. Um, again, I'm not going to, we can go more in the discussion period about what's going on here. What we think is happening very briefly is that, um, uh, that uh, voter t voters in, in, uh, in Treatment 2 um, Overestimate their ability to resist temptation when the when the vote when the when the money actually comes. So they sort of make this pledge, thinking they're tying their hands, and they underestimate the, the uh, how 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 strong they're going to feel about having to be re reciprocal when they actually get the money down uh, down the road. We have a model in the paper that sort of walks uh, walks through that. Okay, just to wrap up, uh, policy implications. Uh, there are there are obviously some interesting implications here. Um, uh, from a policy standpoint. Uh, our results reveal that, somewhat optimistically, right, that, uh, that simple interventions actually can help reduce vote selling. Um, uh, uh, we do see a reduction uh, in the promise in, in, when people pledge not to take any money. Um, uh, uh, but uh, we should avoid treatments or avoid interventions that um, allow voters to, to accept money and then encourage them to vote their conscience. Um, and that's a widely known and, uh, and widely used strategy in the Philippines and elsewhere. Take the bait, not the hook again. Um, that appears to make things worse, if anything. Um, and then finally, um, anti-vote buying campaigns are likely only to make a difference in races where the payments to voters are relatively small. 
Um, we find no evidence that promises help reduce vote selling in the races for mayor and vice mayor in which vote buying payments are, uh, are larger. And I'll go ahead and uh, we've got some things we're going to be doing in the future, but I can talk about those if, if people are interested. We'll go ahead and stop there. Thank you. Welcome to